And to all things comes a beginning. From the ashes of 3DO of New World Computing, Ubisoft scooped up the rights to the Might and Magic franchise with all that it entailed. Heroes of Might and Magic, Might and Magic Crusaders, Champions, that Counter-Strike of Might and Magic thing. And it went on to create a Nintendo DS game about matching jewels to make combat. But apart from that, it went on to publish Heroes of Might and Magic 5, a game that was made by a studio called Nival Interactive. Now, if you're not familiar with Nival, they are from Russia. If you don't know, Heroes of Might and Magic is a big thing in Russia. It's a big thing in, in this part of Europe as well. Central, Eastern, Russia. It, it's, it's the place where Heroes of Might and Magic flourishes. In some areas of the world, it's popular from time to time in certain niches. Here, no, here it is the Call of Duty. Or at least it was for a long while. It was back when this game was released. And the Vault Interactive was a really great company to develop this game because they have experience in this kind of thing. They've made a series called Ether Lords way, way back in the day, which was basically Heroes of Might and Magic mixed with Magic the Gathering because you would collect cards which represented your units. But everything else, that was very, very similar to Heroes. They made a lot of games. They made the Nightwatch game, which is an adaptation of the film slash book series, which you should definitely go watch if you haven't. They're really kooky movies. There was supposed to be a third one. I'm not sure if it was ever made. As for the game itself, imagine something in the style of XCOM, but with vampires. It was neat. I only played a demo of it, but it was neat. And so, in the year 2006, we got Heroes of Might and Magic 5. A game made from scratch. It wasn't based on any of the designs that New World Computing had worked on prior to it being shut down. And that meant that the Ubisoft had the opportunity to do something different, something to really set itself apart from the previous generation. Something to say, hey, if you've never played Heroes before, I know this is called Heroes 5, but it's okay if you start here. It's okay if you've not played the old ones because we will not really care about the old ones in any way. In terms of graphics design, in terms of aesthetics, in terms of lore. But thankfully, they, they did try and keep the design itself, the mechanics, the way it was played, mostly intact. And personally, I kind of attribute the, the good parts of Heroes of Might and Magic 5 to Neval. I don't have any evidence for this, I, I just have a gut feeling that a studio from Russia that got the chance to make a Heroes of Might and Magic game would absolutely make the best one they could. It's just a, like a gut instinctual feeling. Whereas Ubisoft gave us a Sean and has a committee dedicated to making up the lore of a Sean with their Griffin Eternals and the Griffin Empires and things that look like they were taken out of Warcraft 3, complete with character designs and unit designs and kooky things like making orcs a playable race unto themselves in an expansion that I haven't played. My personal experience with Heroes 5 is as follows. When it came out, I had the magazines. I read the reviews, well, the review in the level magazine, and it was one of the worst reviews, the laziest reviews I've ever read. It was a really vague summarization of the game combined with the comparison of what it has in terms of AI, economy and stuff compared to every other game in the series. Okay, that part was neat, but it didn't really dive into the game, into the meat of it. So I just waited until I played it and what I got was a game that took five years to get you past the first turn in the game with a visual design that was 3D in a way that made it a bit confusing, especially in the towns because yeah, the towns were beautiful and all. I mean, you, you, when you first entered the town, it, the camera would spin around and you'd hear the music play and it was beautiful. And then when he when he stopped spinning it, you'd wonder, hey, is this my mages guild or my uh, shrine or something? What I'm getting at is that visually it was a bit muddled. They tried new things. Eh, that's okay to try new things. 
I don't think they succeeded with the things they tried in terms of the aesthetic, in terms of the visuals, and I told them that repeatedly. And, well, they didn't learn much in that sense with the sixth game. Have not played the seventh one yet, so uh, be on the look for, out for that uh, video in 2022. But what, what really, really kind of set me off, really made me front load my dislike for this game, was the setting they went with. They took something that was kooky, zany, strange, weird, and made it vanilla. They they made it vanilla Warcraft, if you will. Uh, something about gods being dragons, which is something that uh, I think Gothic did as well. You know, Griffin Empires and prophecies of demons and stuff. And, and may maybe the lore itself wouldn't be bad on its own. I, I really haven't had the urge to delve deep into it, at least not as much as I did with, with, with the original Mind of Magic lore. And I think one of the reasons that I don't have that urge is that it is presented really, really badly. Now, you can poke fun at the way that uh, some of the cinematics in Heroes 3 were acted, maybe. But there were just a few of them, who cares? You can, you actually can't say anything bad about the cinematics or the, the audio cutscenes and Heroes 4 because they were all amazingly well done. Oh, and by the way, um, if you're gonna watch the Heroes of Mighty Magic 4 video, one of the devs actually commented in that video, and I noticed that about two years later. So I, I'm really sorry I didn't get a chance to respond to you in that video, in the comments, but thank you so much for sharing your experience about actually making the story of Heroes of Might and Magic 4. And I'm really sad that I didn't get a chance to maybe interview you uh, in a show. Now with uh, time being limited, I, I'm not sure if I'll be able to do so anytime soon. But anyway, the, the way that the story was presented to you in the Hero series was mainly through text. Often well-written text. Heroes 5 didn't do that. Heroes 5 had a cinematic approach, and because it had a cinematic approach to pretty much anything it did, it needed certain things for that approach to work, namely it needed dialogue and acting. And it didn't really have those, I mean, there were people talking in those cutscenes, acting them out, but you kinda wish it didn't, because they were terrible. I mean, they were, dear god, they, were, they weren't even funny terrible, they were just terrible. Now this did improve with Hero 6. Hero 6 has cinematics that actually look fine and sound fine. I still don't care about the lore, but they're fine. But with 5, it was a rough time. It was 2006, you know, technology and the, uh, you know, the budgets and what I'm saying is maybe they shouldn't have. So now that I think of it, uh, I don't think it, it was Naval's fault. Uh, Nightwatch was a bit campy, uh, but it looked and sounded better in its cinematics. Also probably doesn't help that a lot of the the central units in the story still use the... Uh, well, there was a style in Heroes where most units, most heroes, looked the same. In Heroes 4 there was a bit of weirdness since Amelia Nighthaven was a brunette and her model and game was blonde. Well, in this, uh, this game there's a bunch of characters that kind of look the same. I was confused by that a lot uh, in the first campaign where the queen is kidnapped and then in the next cinematic someone that looks exactly like her shows up and I wondered, wait, weren't you kidnapped? Why are you still here? Oh, and the those cinematics, they're kind of compulsory if you want to make a custom campaign. So the weirdness is ingrained into the, uh, well not weirdness, the awkwardness is ingrained into the technology of the game which doesn't make it, <laughs> doesn't give it any favors. But that's just a peripherally thing or whatever you call it. It's not really truly super duper important. It is, well it is important, but it's not pivotal. And it also has music, it's there, it's okay, it didn't grab me as much as in Heroes 3 or 4 or 2, but it's, it's there, it's not bad. But the presentation of the game in general, the way it looked, the way it felt, with that, with that interface that is, at the same time small, not invasive, but somehow overly sized. Like it just takes up too much of the screen and at the same time not enough to actually give you any relevant information. Like to, to scroll through your, through your spell book, you have pages upon pages that can only fit a single icon on a row and that icon doesn't really give you much information. It's crowded, but at the same time 
huge and doesn't give you a lot of information at a glance. Uh, what I'm saying is the, the interface kind of blows and I think I think they really wanted to showcase the 3D-ness of the world, which isn't that 3D-ness that necessarily works some of the time because it really gets confusing as to what is where and where you can click sometimes. It's probably better that they went back to a fixed camera position in the next games. It was an experiment that was bound to happen at some point and I'm glad it did because now they learned that maybe this game looks better with a fixed position. Or actually scratch that King's Bounty didn't have a fixed position and it looked amazing. But somehow something here didn't work. Something here didn't click. Probably because I guess the scale of the map was kind of weird. It needed to have things be small so they would fit on the map as elements, but big so you could actually see them. So it all felt a bit crowded. It felt a bit constrained, not constrained, cramped. That's the word, cramped. It felt cramped. Even on the big maps, everything felt cramped. And that really kind of turned me off towards this game, which is a shame because mechanically, in some aspects, it is beautiful. And I mean this, absolutely. The way that the characters can progress is beautiful. They took the Heroes of Might and Magic 3 idea that every hero has his own speciality. You could have someone who's good with vampires, somebody who's good with something else, and they all have a different uh, starting abilities, if you will. And those abilities have sub-abilities, or skills, I should say, have abilities attached to them, just like in Heroes 4. And just like in Heroes 4, certain combinations of abilities will unlock certain skills. Actually, a certain combination of skills and abilities will unlock certain traits, which will give bonuses that can equate to special classes like you had in Heroes 4. You can make a Fallen Knight, for example, which gave a bonus to Dark Magic or something, but gave you a penalty to morale. You could have uh, an, something like an Elemental equil Equilibrium, which meant that whenever your opponent would cast a Summon Elemental spell, you would automatically cast the same spell. It had those little things that would vary from faction to faction, from hero to hero, which made it kind of a joy to actually have your hero progress through time. And now, pretty much everybody had their own special thing. Back in the day, the necromancer was the only one that had their special thing. They could raise the dead. Now everybody had the, the academy or wizards, uh, order, whatever they call them in Heroes 5. They could make artifacts for creatures, which could be equipped. Everybody had their own thing. And, and necromancy, necromancy was no longer OP as hell because you had a limit. You could only revive a certain limit, a certain number of points of units per week, which was a good limitation because now you could raise pretty much kind of any level of unit. Uh, oh, you just killed a bunch of dragons? Yeah, uh, you can you can turn them back to unlife as bone dragons. And then upgrade them to shadow dragons. Thankfully, no snot dragons. They uh, thankfully limited at that. Most units have special abilities. Some more useless than the others. All the units have upgrades. Again, some more useless than the others. Some of them just seem to be there because you need to have an upgrade instead of just having the upgraded version be the one that's the default. It's pretty much nobody's going to use the standard version of a unit in some case, apart from the peasant, because he pays taxes, he pays your wage, he upholds this entire war on his burly shoulders, owed to the peasant. And the combat was... Well, we have squares, just like in Heroes 4, but with a camera that you can move around, and it uh, it's kind of a bit of more of a cramped situation like it was in Heroes 3 and 2 as opposed to how big the combat area was in, uh, in 4. Things that take up space on the uh, combat map, you know, logs, rocks are more important now because you have units that are four squares in size and they can't fit everywhere so you have to be careful where you position them so they'll have a path towards the enemy otherwise they'll just stay there and take hits until they die and they will die you can also have uh, this camera the cinematic camera that lets you see the attacks of the units better i don't think it's actually it actually brings anything useful because it just uh it, 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 it tends to zoom in on vampires and lets you see how they're using a sword. You hear vampires. Why are you using a sword? You are heroes of might and you are might and magic vampires. 
you do not use a sword, you go blur and poke the enemy with your fingers. That's what vampires do, or you know, drain them with your mouth. That's that's how we've established vampires work in this franchise. You're not Kane from Legacy of Kane, you're not the vampire of Blood Omen to use a soul reaver to or a blood reaver to murderize your enemies. Man, the vampires will claim this one. It was like they wanted to be ninjas. And then somebody turned him into a vampire and said they want to be samurai vampire ninjas. Okay, so some of the, some of the designs do look good, like the 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 whip, which turns into uh, death basically. Was the wraith? I kind of get those confused. Some designs do look good, others not so much. Combat works. Uh, can't really say it's super duper ultra mega satisfying. And there, there's just something about the simplicity of it. Actually, not the simplicity of it. It's it's the initiative bar. When it was introduced, it was kind of controversial, if I remember right, because you no longer had units that would act in sequence. They would be combined and interwoven, and high morale would no longer give your unit the ability to attack again right at that moment. Instead, it would, it would let it attack sooner the next time. <sighs> I don't think Hero 6 has the morale, the initiative bar anymore, does it? I don't remember seeing it in Hero 6. Probably for the best. Because on this initiative bar was also your hero. And one big change was that your hero could no longer cast spells outside of their turn. In Heroes 4, I do believe you still could cast spells even though it wasn't technically your hero's turn. Here you cannot, but you can still cast your spells and attack. Well, or attack, I should say. But you're no longer in combat. You are not killable as a hero. Which, okay, I kind of get why they did this. Because in Heroes 4, you could have a party of murder hobos, basically, of overpowered heroes that would go on a rampage and murderize everything if you manage to get them all to that level and, you know, keep bringing back their bodies if they died. Here you would only have one hero per party and that hero could attack, that hero could use abilities, but that hero would not be on the field of combat. It was a return to the traditional, one that people celebrated in some ways because like I probably said in the Heroes 4 uh, video, not everybody liked Heroes 4. Not everybody enjoyed what it did. And Heroes 5 didn't do that. It went towards a more traditional route. It tried to balance things by taking some good ideas from Heroes 4 and a lot of them from Heroes 3. Quite a lot of them from Heroes 3. Most of them from... actually all of them from Heroes 3 because when you're talking about heroes it's usually Three and the rest. Three, three is the one that people want to play again and again and again. Most people, I mean, I, I'm more partial towards two and maybe four. But three, three is the one that people shoot for when they want to remake something, to enhance something, to create the hero's killer, if you will. But for the most part, combat worked. It was okay. The campaigns and their stories were... Uh, I never actually finished all the campaigns of the game. I, I only finished the first one. And I was so disappointed that I didn't really bother finishing the rest of them. I, I played them a bit but didn't finish them. I don't think I've ever touched the content added in the first expansion, the Hammers of Fate. Not really sure what that one's about. And I don't even own the second expansion, Tribes of the East. That one, I've been told, actually changes the engine a bit so that when you set it to a 16x9 format, it actually properly scales the image instead of just stretching it out and making it look weird. And it's certainly not available on GOG. The GOG version of Heroes of Might and Magic 5, which, which is the one you're seeing on the background, doesn't have uh, Tribes of the East. It's, it's not available there. And coming back to it now, well, the game, I would say, hasn't aged super well. Not just because of the, the graphics part or the aspect ratio part, but when you start a game with the maximum number of, of opponents, like eight players on a map, I think. Turn one of an empty map, a map with, where everybody has one castle, each and everybody's in one corner, they all have one hero, that takes a minute. It takes a minute on Horizon 7. Jesus Christ. This game is fundamentally tedious to play. Now mind you, I, I've played, I tried to make a video about uh, Caveman to Cosmos from Civilization 4 and that also takes bloody ages, but that's what like 20 civilizations on a map the size of the earth. This one just takes too long and it's not even because it's showing the movement of the enemy units, it, it just goes slowly. It's a similar experience to what I had when playing 
Heroes 3 on my old Pentium 133 MHz back in the day, where it too would take a while to process the turns of my enemies. Though in that case it was because I had a PC which could not even run the game properly. I had a 640x480 screen and it needed an 800x600 screen. Here it just, it just doesn't run well. There's probably a mod or a patch of their community patch that makes things better. I honestly didn't have the drive to look. But being slow and tedious did give me time to appreciate the little things, the, the weeks. Now this is something that Heroes 4 did not do and I am really sad that it didn't do but Heroes 5 did it. Every week is a week of the something and it does something very beautiful. It doesn't just say oh it's the week of the aardvark, it actually tells you something about that week. It tells you something that could be monumentally stupid but it's there, it, 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 it's world building, it's it's fluff, it's 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 context. Like there, there's a week of the, what was it, Demogorgon or something? Which like all Demogorgons or something increase in numbers. Sadly they were all killed and went extinct ages ago so there's none of them. You know, there's, there's humor there, there's, there's charm, it's, it's like what the, the spells in Heroes 4 had, which the spells in Heroes 5 don't have. The spells in Heroes 5 uh, feel flat, like they feel super flat, mega ultra double glazed flat, but they're useful, they can be useful, they just don't have any charm to them, any poetry, any magic, if you will, to them. But to someone else, maybe they do, maybe to somebody that played this game as their first Heroes of Mighty Magic game, maybe to somebody that didn't grow up with, or at least didn't meet Heroes 4, or Heroes 3 or Heroes 2, as they were growing up, when they were in high school and dreaming of a bright future, when everybody could live in peace and harmony, where hamsters are giants and men are legends. If you want to play Heroes 5, go for it. It's on GOG. Half of it is on GOG. For Tribes of Deeds, you have to go to Steam. It's, it's a divisive game, I would say. But I feel it is the best effort. Now again, I haven't played Heroes 7. It's the best effort that Ubisoft ever made at creating a Heroes of Might and Magic game. And again, I attribute a lot of this to the fact that it was made by Nival Interactive. I mean, these are the people that made Rage of Mages. Remember Rage of Mages? Man, I have not made a video about that, have I? I've only played the second one. Never finished it. It was amazingly hard as a game. Couldn't cheat in it either. I kept trying to cheat didn't work. You may enjoy Heroes 5, you may enjoy it more than I ever could. Maybe for you it isn't tainted because you you haven't maybe tried the previous ones, haven't seen what, what they're capable of. Maybe you don't mind the aesthetic, the, the, the way everything looks, it's just kind of off somehow. Maybe you'll find the spark here that I couldn't. Or maybe you could play Heroes 3 or 2 or 4. That is also an option. Some would say a better option. I would say a better option. But at least we can all agree it's not Heroes 6. Because that one I didn't get to play on release date. They uh, they gave me a review copy for it. Still have it in the box. Couldn't play it on an Athlon 64 though. Took months to actually get it reviewed because it wouldn't work on an Athlon 64. But I'll get to it again next year. And hopefully I'll have more videos before next year. And hey, who knows? Maybe there'll be videos about other things, different things, stranger things, things that are not maybe entirely video game centric but somewhat related. Okay, that was kind of horrible, but I, I do have a keyboard that can play music now, so it's it's a thing. I'm probably going to try and make uh, my own music for these videos. Currently, I can't actually play it. I, I can't play it, normal music on it. I can play some things, but it takes time to set things up. So, who knows? It's a wild world out there. Mostly because everybody's inside and the wild animals have taken over. Who knows what the future will kill? Okay, the future, we kind of know what will it will bring. And it's a bit grim dark, but... There could be good things out there for some people. People adept at staying inside their house and playing Heroes 5 and trying to learn to play the chicken dance. Goodbye.